So we are moving to another panel discussion. In the morning, we have listened to the sharing for the topic how global micropayment can solve the financial exclusion problem from GetPip. So today, right now, we'll get to deep dive further into the topic of Web3 and financial inclusion with the panel, is decentralization the key to financial inclusion? So now please join me to welcome the guest for this panel discussion. First of all, please welcome Mr. Tan Le, co-founder from Coin96 Finance. Welcome MJ, head of products from Cosmity Labs. Welcome Vish, founding engineer from Siga. Welcome Eugene Park, head of growth from Pine Protocol. And our moderator, please welcome Phil, co-founder from Airfoil. Hello, everybody. It's great to see everybody here. Um, see my co-founder back there waving to me. Um, welcome to this panel on Is Decentralization the Key to Financial Inclusion? Um, I want to start by introducing uh, today's panelists uh, once again, just so everybody has um, context and everybody here. Um, it's really exciting to have so many folks that are across the space in so many different ways. Um, Tan, of course, is the co-founder of the number one crypto super app exchange and portfolio management tool in Vietnam, uh, Coin98. Uh, we have MJ from Proximity Labs that's leading product development at the primary R&D firm supporting DeFi on Nier and Aurora. Um, Vish uh, is founding engineer of Sega, which is uh, working on DeFi's first exotic options protocol. Um, Eugen, leading growth at Pine, um, decentralized NFT-backed borrowing and lending protocol. And of course, uh, you know, back a little bit of background on me, um, I co-founded a company called Airfoil that's a design and branding firm that's worked with everyone from Solana Labs and Near to over 100 startups across the Web3 space as a whole. Um, but fundamentally, the core question that I think we want to answer today is around what DeFi will actually look like at scale. I think that for many of us, when we first discovered what Web3 tech and what blockchains could do, the prospect of creating a fairer, open, more open and more inclusive financial system was something that drew us in. But that's a really vague concept. It's a vague topic. And I want to see how much we can get to specifics across the next 40 minutes. So I want to start with a question for everybody in the panel here today, which is, um, given the context on everything that we all do, I'm wondering, what does DeFi enable your project or company to uniquely do that you definitely wouldn't be able to do using centralized financial rails? And maybe let's, uh, let's get started with uh, Ten. Okay, so you know we are building a wallet, so I think like, one of the things that really DeFi enables us to do is like, you know, the ability to control um, all the assets um, on chains, you know, uh, within my wallet. Um, I think in the last couple of months, we received a lot of crash crisis coming out from all this kind of like uh, centralized platform like FTX and like um, uh, Cel Celsius and uh, you know a couple of each chain as well. And then and when all this kind of like crisis happens, you know, I think the mo like the people who got the most um, effect is the users because you know they basically custodies all the assets within the platform and then somehow the platform they misuse the the assets that you know didn't own by them then i think like you know the ability that define enables us to being able to control you know uh the assets that i have in my wallet and i can do whatever i want and then you know nobody can really touch the wallet that um, you know sitting in my wallet that would be the like the fantastic thing that you know, define enables us Sure. Uh, so I work at Proximity Labs. So we don't build DeFi projects ourselves, but we work with a lot of the DeFi projects. Um, so I think I can think of like two use cases. So number one, it's probably more of like crypto use case, um, is that so we have a grant program, right? So we provide like monetary support to various DeFi projects across the world, right? And uh, luckily, we don't have to go through the traditional banking system to send you know wires to all, all these companies across the world, like you know in all the continents, right? It will take you know a long time. And uh, uh, sometimes when you know those wires you know go you know go wrong or got delayed, right? We have to kind of you know contact both the sending bank and the receiving bank to kind of figure out where the wire is, right? It's very inefficient. So with crypto, you know, this is not not a problem. And the second thing is that so for like some of our employees, so um, they get you know some some tokens as part of their total compensation, right? So what we offer them is that uh, we offer them to 
stake their invested tokens, right, with you know one of the you know many uh, validators available out there, right, and thinks everything is on chain, it's through DeFi, it's you know permissionless, so it is extremely you know frictionless to set everything up. You don't have to like you know set up you know account for individual employees, no paperwork, um, so yeah, super you know super frictionless. Hi, um, I'm Vish from Sega. So, as you mentioned, we're an options protocol um, available on, De on DeFi. What I would say where we really come in is, as, as a DeFi protocol, our focus is on how we can help people earn staking yields. Um, and primarily, our, the staking asset we operate on is with USDC. So I always like to joke, you give us some money, we give you more money, uh, which I guess is what most people do. But I, I think what we do as an options product is that uh, we provide we open access to products that typically most people don't get um, as a structured product which has and tracks multiple underlying assets these typically are done and highly available in certain geographical regions but it's fairly complex um, but they actually operate really well in terms of uh, in volatile markets so just recently for example with the fluctuation of, of BTC and ETH, uh, all our APOIs go up. So it is actually quite a defensive strategy um, that I think most people don't have access to. And especially when you're in crypto, uh, you need a place that feels safe, that feels secure, that feels like you um, are confident that you're going to actually generate real yield that's not like inflated in other ways. And I think opening up access to low-risk um, strategies that actually people have confidence in uh, that are not available to most people is what DeFi makes it super easy to do. Um, anybody with a wallet, like you mentioned, anybody with a wallet can sign in, sign in, well, connect um, and uh, participate in, in these yields. Yeah, so uh, my name is Brian, and I'm with uh, Pine Protocol. And what we've built out is uh, NFT Fi, um, is what we call it. Uh, so basically, what we're doing is taking a lot of the concepts of DeFi and bridging NFTs into that concept. Um, so kind of the reason, you know, one of the main reasons that we actually created uh, Pine was that liquidity within the NFT space itself was very was a big problem. Um, you know, pro uh, users would have basically their NFTs. And if they need instant liquidity, they would have to basically floor price sell um, their NFTs. Um, so we've created basically a matching platform uh, between willing lenders and borrowers. Um, and that way the borrowers are, or sorry, the lenders are actually able to choose their own terms uh, and dictate kind of what they want to earn on their digital assets. And I think this is a very powerful concept because, you know, within the traditional finance sphere, it's basically the banks deciding um, what terms they want, what at, uh, sorry, what assets they accept. Um, whereas we're basically uh, using blockchain technology and decentralization to make that process available and open to everyone. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for th for that and and for explaining kind of like how your how your projects are are utilizing kind of Web three and, and and DeFi tech in a really unique way. Um, and I think one key point that I heard there was the importance of being able to make these financial tools open to everyone, regardless of where they are in the world, which has never been possible before. And I think that speaks to the, the importance of the tech that we're building here. Um, but I want to also uh, try to create a vision of what this looks like at scale and start to fill in some of the details for what DeFi looks like when it's fully accessible, not just to any country, but accessible to billions of people around the world. So uh, this is a question for everybody. Uh, how thoroughly can Web3 run on decentralized rails? Do you think that it's inevitable that gradually users will prefer greater centralization, centralized exchanges, hosted wallets, et cetera? Um, or, or otherwise, what is the strong reason that it's important that users have direct ownership of their assets and currencies in Web3? Essentially, do you think it's inevitable we could become more centralized? Or do you think that um, that, that we're actually going to head in a more decentralized direction. Um, so I guess I can go first. So I feel like if you look at a lot of the you know, DeFi applications, or Web3 applications right now, I don't believe that they are fully, they are fully decentralized. 
Because even though they have their smart contracts running on blockchain, which is decentralized, right? But if you look at their front end, a lot of them are still running on centralized hosting providers like AWS, Cloudflare, or GCP, right? And over the last few years, we have seen a lot of cases where um, you know, these hosting providers or the development team of its front ends, they do not actually share kind of the community ethos that, that we believe in Web3, right? For example, um, I think um, one inch blocked users from the USA, right, about two years ago. Um, and uh, um, uh, there's another example, I think. Um, yeah, so for example, Uniswap, I think about a, about a couple of years ago, they also decided to remove like over 100 tokens from their user interface, right? So because their user interface is still, is still centralized, so that's something that they could do. That's, that, that's why I believe that uh, at the moment, if you look at a lot of the DeFi projects, they are not fully decentralized. And if we are talking about you know, decentralized applications, that should include the entire stack, both the back end and the front end. Um, and I think the second part of your question was that uh, whether user would prefer uh, a centralized uh, solution over time. Um, I think given all the kind of crisis and collapse you know, we observed in the last 12 months, I don't think so, because we've seen like all these you know, centralized institutions kind of blew up for whatever reasons in different ways, right? Uh, but before all this crisis happened, I could see there is like a, you know, an, an argument where some of the users do prefer centralized um, you know, solutions for different reasons. For example, easier onboarding, right? you know, maybe better liquidity. Right? But I think these are the problems that um, you know, DeFi should fix. Right? We should you know, provide a better onboarding experience, provide like a Web2 kind of like, you know, onboarding experience to, to those users, and to provide a better education so users understand you know, what's the value of the product, so what they can do with the product, things like that. So as a quick follow-up, I just wanted to ask, um, when you mentioned that there's parts of the stack that are not fully decentralized, I'm wondering if you could quickly run through what are the parts that you think uh, need to be very quickly rebuilt in a decentralized way to realize that vision? Yeah, I think uh, to me, for sure, the top priority is front-end. So there's actually some solutions right now available, right? Actually, sorry for the shilling, but Nier just you know, announced the blockchain operating system at East Denver. So we actually, I believe we have the you know, easiest solution available on the market right now for people to build decentralized front ends. And actually, uh, even though it's released by Nier, but it's actually chain agnostic. So you can actually build front end that interact with you know, uh, smart contracts on any blockchain. So we actually already have examples um, to, you know, of, of you know, front ends that you know, for applications on Ethereum, you know, Polygon, um, Arbitrum, BNB chain, and so forth. So yeah, so uh, if you're interested, you can go to Nier.org and to kind of you know, play with one of the, you know, play with an early version of the blockchain operating system. Sorry for Shin, I'll stop here. Yeah, um, so I, I, yeah, I think that's actually a very interesting question. I think we've seen examples of centralization. We've seen examples of decentralization. And we've also seen how certain organizations have changed in their ethos over time based off circumstances. So based off like new regulation that's hitting the US, how uh, protocols have to adapt to be able to handle that. To be honest, I think the centralization versus decentralization, if, so, so if we look at it as like in the, the blockchain space, to be honest, the history is, is very short-lived. Uh, it's just like a couple decades. Uh, but I think if you look at the grand scheme of history, like over say centuries or millennia and stuff, there's always a, a natural element of Everybody tries to do things by themselves. They find packs, they find tribes, they find communities, and then they start working together. And then something causes it to um, maybe be pushed beyond the limit, and then it, it self-corrects so that it comes back to a little bit more of a decentralized situation. So if you look at, say, the 2008 financial crisis, you've got a few different banks that were super centralized, took on a lot of risk, and w wasn't able to handle it, um, then they were talking about breaking up the big banks, things separated. Again, uh, so it, it's kind of this life journey that we go through as humans. Uh, it, it sounds weird to say, but like uh, we're, we're, a, we're going up and down on the cycle of centralization and decentralization. But one constant that's actually happening is that hum like us humans are getting more options. We're getting more choices. So... The advantage of DeFi and, and crypto 
in general is that it gives people now the option to self custody assets. Um, previously, that option never existed. The only way you could self custody was if you kept cash under your bed, right? So, um, in theory, like now you have this optionality to connect with the financial ecosystem, which never existed before. And I think over time, um, getting that flexibility for the individual is still just going to provide a much better experience. And as education and stuff grows up, I think there's naturally going to be a hybrid of decentralized and centralized environments. And you use certain things for certain aspects of your life. You use other things for different aspects of your life. I really, I really love that point because to me, it, it feels a lot like the sort of unbundling and rebundling that happens, especially in consumer applications, right? It's like everybody wants to use one social media platform, but then eventually other ones strike individual pieces, pulling people away, and then now there's too many apps and everyone comes back. So it, it seems uh, to reflect the way that the internet's developed, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add in our approach as well. Um, so I think something that people really do need to realize as well is that kind of within a centralized financial system, um, especially in the case of loans, right? There's somebody along the line that's making that decision whether this is, you know, a good, like, I guess the, the risk levels, like someone's making that decision and that's really subject to basic, like, subjectivity, um, human decision, human error. Uh, whereas I think with decentralization, it kind of avoids that, right? It's basically smart contracts. It's making the decision for you. The borrower and the lender can just pick their terms and if it matches, it matches, right? Um, so I think that's kind of one of the reasons that we, I think, uh, decentralized kind of lending will take off going forward, yeah. That's awesome. Um, I was going to even ask on that, cause I, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question I was thinking of uh, next uh, anyhow, because I think it strikes at that, um, which is crossing back to this question of like, why DeFi, like why should decentralized finance grow and scale, um, especially uh, towards... Uh, um, to its vision, and, and uh, Brian, um, what, what are the main reasons that you think users will prefer getting yield from your protocols versus investing in traditional financial products? What is kind of that value prop, and what types of users are you seeing uh, currently adopting the products you're building? Yeah, honestly, I guess kind of the easiest answer is this. Um, let's say you have like, I don't know, 100K sitting around, and you want to earn yield on that. You go to the bank. You basically have to choose from a list of different options that are available, right? And those terms basically are set by the banks. Um, so there's no flexibility. You can't choose, you know, how to how much risk you want to expose yourself to. You can't choose which assets you want to be um, exposed to as well. Whereas, kind of within the NFT fi lending space, and especially with what we've built at Pine Protocol, the lenders basically choose which NFTs they want exposure to. So if I have, you know, I have ETH for example, and I want to earn yield. Um, but I only want to support like BAYCs or CryptoPunks. I can choose that and I can set my interest rates and my ten, uh, the durations as long as I want. So I could set it to like 500% APR, right? And as long as there's a willing borrower, then that transaction is made um, and then the deal is good, right? So it's having access to those type of options and choosing what you do with your yield or how you want to earn your yield, uh, which assets you want to expose yourself to in terms of risk, um, I think has been a really big selling point for our users. Um, in terms of, the, I think the second part of the question was asking about what type of users. Uh, so we're getting a lot of interest from institutional lenders as well, um, simply because they're able to actually choose which assets they want to expose themselves to. And another thing is that all of our pools are segregated, right? So basically the smart contract, what it's doing is creating basically a pool between the lender and the borrower. Um, there's no room, I guess, for third-party interference. Um, so if we, you know, if we were to facilitate a loan between us, no one else can actually do anything about that. And as long as the loan's paid off, you know, your NFTs return to you. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're getting a lot of interest from users that basically want the flexibility um, in how they want to earn their yield, how much yield they want to earn, and what they want to expose themselves to. Cool. Um, yeah, I think. In terms of the users uh, Sega are attracting, we actually have quite a good hybrid of both retail and institutional investors. So high net worth, family offices, together with retail. Um, I think one of the things that we actually do pretty well is that 
because the, the, the strategies that we deploy, are the, op the option strategies that we make available to people, really protect people in terms of high volatility markets. Um, and that access to those kind of products is something typically only ultra high net worths actually have access to. Um, so one of the things, for example, like with the recent volatility that happened this week, all our APYs just significantly increased, um, which is something where usually when, you, usually when you're in volatile markets, it can scare people off. Uh, but to know that you have a place to effectively uh, stake assets that can actually do better during volatile markets gives you a different kind of asset exposure than you would have otherwise. So I think uh, that's one of the, like, the strategies that we make available. We are still working on finding a variety of more strategies uh, based off our users. So uh, we're quite good about listening to our users and deploying new and new strategies so that we're, we're evolving, right? Um, obviously, what works well in a bear market is going to work differently in a bull market. And you, you, both, you have to have a very good pulse on what your users want. So I think, uh, that's, I, I think that's kind of the feedback. And I, I think, like a few people mentioned, um, the messaging that we have available is something intuitive for people to understand. It's something that people can resonate with, something people can connect with. And honestly, whenever you're dealing with assets and wealth, sometimes simplicity and um, clear messaging and building trust with the users is something that's important, especially people that are retail investors that are trying to get started in DeFi, uh, all the way to people that are holding bags. Um, I think th that, um, that m clear messaging is something that's really important. And I think the structure of our products in itself um, actually provide a different kind of asset hedge compared to a lot of other products that are available in, in, the, in the space right now. That's actually, I think, a really great segue to uh, where I'd like to go with kind of the next question. We've talked a lot about um, why, uh, why DeFi is relevant, why it's important, some of the barriers to ensuring that it remains as decentralized as possible. Um, but I wanted to, um, give me one moment to read the question. But I wanted to ask a little bit about um, barriers to DeFi user adoption as a whole. Uh, and so I want to turn especially to uh, Tan and MJ on this, um, given that I feel that you have a really great bird's eye view of so many different DeFi protocols across different chains and ecosystems. What are some of the biggest challenges that you see to average investors, regular people around the world onboarding and beginning to use DeFi? Um. I think that for me, there would be two challenges that we're seeing right now for the onboarding process. The first one is like um, the wallet concept itself is not something that really very familiar with you know every Web2 users or traditional users you know uh, ever experience. Um, people don't understand that you know if they create a crypto wallet and then they forgot to back up their seed phrase, they're gonna you know their assets is like it's gone forever. So one of the things that I, you know, one of the phrases that I really like is like, um, like you know, having a non-custodial uh, wallet means that you know it's give you the freedom to you know control your assets, but it's also give you hundred percent of responsibility for all the assets that you custody. And then um, uh, you know, I don't think you know a lot of people are aware of this. Uh, it brings me to the next, second challenge that you know education. Um, onboarding process is like not something really easy right now for people. The wallet concept is like you know hard to understand, and people don't don't understand you know how to you know the risk involved when every time they interact with like you know a protocol. Let's say that you know, if, in they, if they interact with like a protocol that got exploited and then they have got like infinite like approve for that that contract. Um, it's never happened in, in, in Web2, right? It's never happened. And then there will be somebody who like, like step up and then, hey, like, this is my fault. And, you know, I provided services. I'm going like, to take that responsibility from, you know, for your loss. And then I'm going like, to cover your loss and stuff, stuff like that. Um, so education would be like, you know, it's, it's might take a lot of time for people. So um, I think that would be two challenges that I've seen, you know, really um, avoid you know, a lot of people and then drop a lot of people. You know, uh, every time we go trying to like, you know, bring more people to Web3. 
Yeah, I just want to echo Antian's point on the challenge in like onboarding and education. Um, so I actually have a real, real world example. So I have a friend who works, who works as a PM in a, in a Tradify uh, company, super smart dude, right? So, but he has zero experience in Web3. So one day he approached me and said, hey, I saw that you're working in DeFi now. Can you give me some pointers, like some of the you know, top products I should you know, play with, right? So I sent him you know, a bunch of links, including like you know, Uniswap, you know, Aave, Compound, things like that. And two hours later, he's like, WTF is this? <laughs> so he looked at it like the Uniswap you know, website, but has no idea how to use it, right? And then I explained to him a little bit, he understood, okay, so he needs to set up a wallet with MetaMask first, right? And that took some time, and he, he needed to learn about, you know, C phrases, things like that. And then uh, he started to, to use the product. He realized, oh, he needs to pay gas, but there's nothing, you know, in his wallet, right? So that's the second hurdle that he, he needs to, to jump through. Um, and then, yeah, and even, you know, after that, he still needs to learn about the mechanics of the product, you know, whether, you know, how it works, you know, what he can get from the product, things like that. So yeah, I think onboarding education is definitely a very important, you know, a, you know top challenge. Uh, for DeFi projects. So we need to, like I mentioned earlier, we need to have like Web2 kind of like um, unborn experience for new users. And I think another challenge right now is that I think our ecosystem, you know, the DeFi ecosystem is still very, you know, self-referential. So basically we, you know, invented a bunch, of a bunch of tokens, right? And then we, you know, trade those tokens, right? We gamble on those tokens. Um, I think to really kind of expand into new territories to get more users into DeFi, we need more use cases. Um, for example, so one thing that I am really interested in is, you know, bringing real world assets on chain, right? How can we bring things like, you know, treasury bills, you know, uh, real estate uh, on chain so that, you know, these are real use cases people want to invest in. And I think this is another way for DeFi to gain new, to gain, to gain net new users. Awesome. Uh, so those are kind of the specific uh, questions I want to get to for individual members of the panel. Um, and we've got 13 minutes left, and we've got some awesome uh, folks up here with, with a ton of experience building DeFi products. So I've got a few more questions I want to ask, but in addition, if there's any questions from the audience as well, um, please feel free to raise your hand. I'll repeat your question up, up here. Uh, we can run through it with the, with the panelists here. So is there any questions from the audience before we continue? Anything at all? OK. Well, let's, uh, let's keep going. Uh, so, I, recently there's been some news uh, that DeFi might integrate a little bit better with the global financial system, uh, for example, in Hong Kong, where it appears that the Chinese government has put pressure on traditional banks um, to bank uh, with uh, uh, you know, the uh, companies operating in the crypto space, um, both centralized exchanges as well as um, foundations and, and the labs that works behind a lot of different protocols. Um, at the same time, though, there's been more of a regulatory crackdown uh, in the U.S., for example, with uh, the SEC's view that a, a lot of uh, native tokens and protocols are actually securities. Um, in, in general, as we look to grow DeFi and increase its adoption, um, do we think, in general, that it's better to focus on markets with relatively with weaker regulatory regimes? That may, maybe it might be easier to get adoption, or rather to just avoid uh, a strong regulatory crackdown? Or do we anticipate that it makes more sense to go after the largest financial markets where there's probably more capital available from people to invest? Do we go for like mass market, but a lot of more developing markets? Or do we go for um, uh, kind of the, the, the wealthiest uh, existing markets? And anybody feel free to jump in. All right, so I think like just, uh I think for me, you know, the answer would be depends on where you're strong at. Like somebody's, you know, some of my friends is like, you know, have a very strong background in traditional finance. They have like tremendous connections with other regulators and stuff. For all these people, I do recommend and you know, just like go and work with like, you know, the, the people that they already met and like, you know, really have a strong connections and like trying to win. This is like having this kind of connection is like unfair advantage compared to other startups already. So like that's where they should focus. But for normal startups that don't have this kind of connections, um, I think like, you know, starting where, you know, we have like less competitions and then get the first like thousand true fans and then just expand from there would be like a better way. Um, yeah, just, just to add on. So 
I'm actually visiting from Hong Kong, so we've actually seen some of this uh, excitement that's happening around the crypto space there. I think one of the things to keep in mind, just like with any kind of project, is there are multiple roles and multiple stakeholders and um, yeah, multiple roles that need to take place. So Hong Kong, they're evolving a lot in, in the sense like banking, crypto companies and, and regulatory, regulation wise. Um, but there are certain use cases that work in Vietnam that wouldn't work in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, um, the Hong Kong dollar is like somewhat pegged to the US dollar. So we don't actually have um, volatility in that sense, right? So um, in terms of population, the population is significantly smaller than, than Vietnam. So um, one of the things that is a potentially a use case, I mean, not a use case, but how people structure is they might structure their entities in Hong Kong, um, work with institutional investors in Hong Kong and focus on, uh, like what you're saying, what you're good at. If, if, if the thing that you're good at is actually adopting gamers and, and building communities, then certain regions are, are nascent and really good for that. Um, I, I'm obviously going to shill Hong Kong because uh, anybody that wants to come through, hit, hit us up at Sega. Um, but I think Hong Kong has certain great financial infrastructure, both in the traditional finance space and now even in the decentralized finance space. Um, but the, the environment and the, the problems that you're trying to solve for users are fundamentally different than problems that you're trying to solve for users in Vietnam or in other countries. And the most important thing is a, basically what problem are you trying to solve? How are you trying to help people? Once you figure that out, um, how you structure it or how you package it together is, is a different, is like an operational problem, not a big picture um, what your company is trying to focus on problem. I want to double click on that too, um, around like what sort of uh, what sort of protocols, things we can build, you know, helping different types of users as well. How would we categorize the different types of users in DeFi today? I, I feel like there is an image of the DeFi kind of DGen investor uh, that sometimes gets referred to, including in the the previous talk. Um, but I, I'm wondering if we can isolate kind of like some key personas of like. These are the types of people who get value from DeFi, and these are the um, uh, these are the types of people who get value from DeFi, and these are the best applications of DeFi tech to them. And, and feel free to use examples as well from like the the protocols that you're that you're building. Someone's there's a buzzing coming somewhere. Right? I don't know. Yeah. But does anyone want to jump in? Sure. So I think in terms of the personas of DeFi, right? I think um, I can think of like three types of users right now. Number one is like retail users, right? Who don't really understand like you know how the mechanics works underneath, right? They are just here uh, because they heard you know this protocol has like you know high APR, right? Um, and number two is like DJ users who you know who knows how to audit a smart contract, who knows how to you know check if you know something. Um, is legit. It, it's it's tr trustworthy, and who knows? You know all these you know different uh, strategies to maximize their their yields in, yields in DeFi, right? And then uh, there are institutions, right? Uh, like family, you know, offices, things like that, who are sitting on you know a large pile of cash and they want to diversify into in, into crypto. So I think these are the three uh, persona um, of DeFi, um, in my opinion. But I sorry, I, I forgot your your second part of the question. <laughs> I, I guess, so I think that's a really great kind of overview of the different personas. Um, I, if, if you remember all three of those personas, I'd love if we could see if we could run through what are kind of the primary applications of DeFi that appeal to those personas. Like what, 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 where do those personas find the most value from DeFi tech today? So I think for like, um, obviously all, all the three personas there are Looking for uh, you know returns on their capital, right? So I think you know lending you know lending market um, are definitely you know probably uh, one of the top categories that they will be interested in. And for um, some of the you know um, DGNs or like you know institutions, 
um, they probably have some you know more complicated strategy right where uh, one, one example um, that's uh, from you know another, another friend of me is that um, so he was actually looking into real estate right and he found a property that he wanted to buy and he was working on you know a very tight uh, timeline right and um, he had like most of the cash to close the transaction but he needed like you know 100 200k right uh, so instead of going to a traditional bank to get a mortgage, so what he did is that uh, he happened to have, you know, a bag of ETH, right? He just used, you know, one of the lending protocols and got some stable coins and cashed it out and closed the, the transaction. So these are some of the things that, you know, DJs are, are doing nowadays, you know, that kind of um, also inter intersect with their, what they're doing, you know, in, in, the, in the real world. So I think that has an appeal um, as, um, as well. And also, um, yeah, so I think that's that's just an example of uh, you know how people are using it. Yeah, and I can just add in too, like, to be honest, for me, I feel like it takes a special type of person to be able to drop, you know, 100K, 200K on an NFT. Um, but the way I see it is that these people, they're pretty smart when it comes to money and making that money move, right? Um, you know, so if someone's dropping, you know, 100, 200K on a BAYC, for example, they probably understand that, you know, it makes sense for them to actually utilize kind of that hidden liquidity within that BAYC, you know, um, whether it's through a loan, um, whether it's, you know, just holding it or using it as a PFP and you know, renting it out, whatever. Um, just they're always looking for ways to make money, I think. And I think that's kind of, you know, when we look at our user base, you know, we see a lot of whales coming in, um, putting in their high value NFTs, taking that money out. And we actually do track some of these wallets to see what they're doing. And, you know, like we'll see people that are basically leveraging their NFTs, um, borrowing ETH, using that ETH to farm more ETH or farm more uh, yield. Um, so I think there's definitely a lot of potential within kind of the NFT FI space. And yeah. Awesome. And I want to ask kind of one uh, closing question, uh, just given how many folks are coming here trying to figure out what to build next, right, to, to enhance this sort of adoption. I, I'm wondering if everybody can list either one piece of infrastructure or one type of interface that you really wish existed that would make your jobs easier as people trying to usher in um, decentralized finance? One of the ideas I keep talking lately is like, I think that would be, that should be a like, kind of like combination between AI and crypto and then using, um, um, you know, AI to analyze and answer the question of like normal users in a very user friendly way. Let's say you, know, you drop in like, there would be a tool that you uh, leveraging an AI, you put in a wallet and then it will tell you everything you, you need to know about that wallet is in, like including analyzing the, uh, the strategies, how to make money, you know, where's the money come from, you know, is this is like black wallet or like, you know, white wallet and all this stuff. So for me, that would be a, a very good idea that, so, you know, welcome everyone to, to build. So for me, I think um, one of the top problems in our ecosystem right now um, is fragmentation, right? So we have like, a, you know, very fragmented ecosystem where like different blockchains have different applications, right? Um, different tools, different user experience. So uh, this leads to another problem, which is like, you know, discoverability, right? When a user starts to explore a new blockchain, how can they quickly like identify all the marquee, real, trustworthy applications, right? It will take time. So I think one thing that I would really like to see that each ecosystem build up, put together is like a, maybe like an all-in-one ecosystem page where they have all the, you know, marquee protocols right there. So users doesn't have to jump multiple, you know, hops to identify those applications, right? And this could be put together by like the foundation of the ecosystem, but it could also be put together by uh, the community if the foundation wants to, to stay neutral. So uh, in terms of things that need to be built, uh, to be honest, every day I go into the office, I'm like, all right, there's so many more things that we need, <laughs> we need uh, infrastructure for, um, especially as an engineer, I think, one of the things that we've kind of been exploring recently is around interoperability um, with other protocols. So, and how, because one of the main advantages of crypto is the ability to partner and work with other protocols quite seamlessly. Um, and 
I think one of the challenges in the space is that, to be honest, on the, on the surface, everybody looks great and everybody, um, but as soon as you dig into the code, it's not necessarily the case. Um, so if there was like more robust infrastructure that allowed stronger in interoperability um, and I think more intuitive understanding of what's happening with different protocols, it would definitely speed up adoption and speed up like synergies between different companies. Um, a lot of the times you can lose like multiple days like trying to figure out what they're actually doing, obscured behind like a, a massive docs and stuff. Um, and it it's, tends to be a barrier when there is a finite amount of time and resources that you have in the day. So infrastructure that would promote interoperability um, I think is definitely something that would allow each protocol to leverage their own skills significantly more um, by building this joint community in some ways. Yeah, so for us, I think kind of the biggest thing that uh, we would want is just a better understanding and better infrastructure around NFTs, right? Um, if you actually think about it, NFTs are basically just tokens. Um, but that DeFi system that's built around tokens, it doesn't exist for NFTs yet. I mean, you know, there's, you know, staking of NFTs and people are experimenting and playing around and trying out new things and new use cases for NFTs. But I don't think that's been specifically defined. Um, so I think kind of just uh, building up that infrastructure is going to be the most important thing. Thanks so much to everyone up here. Let's give them all a round of applause. And thanks for coming today. Once again, thank you so much for joining with us today. Thank you.